Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a chat as a follow-up to my video on the best recordings of the Brahms Violin Concerto. Now, in that video, I got a lot of very, very good comments from you very, very quickly, I might add, um, talking about the impossibility of, of actually coming up with a list of a work that's been recorded so many times, often multiple times by the same violinist. But one of the things I was struck by is how many of you mentioned the fact that I had not put in my list. Despite all my disclaimers, despite saying it wasn't meant to be you know, a completely comprehensive list, which is impossible, and that everyone will have their favorites, which I would leave out, and that I really was sort of hoping we won't get to one of those, well, I like this, I like that, I like this, I like that discussion, where it just becomes a giant morass of, of listiness which isn't terribly helpful to people who don't know the work, just hearing what a million different people like and the fact that there are a billion different performances that everybody thinks are the same. So I want to make a little point about it because the violinist, the violinist most frequently mentioned, who I did not mention, was, was Henrik Schering. Now, Henrik Schering was a wonderful violinist. No question about it absolutely marvelous. And his Brahms concerti are pretty fabulous. I don't deny it. Not in the least. He recorded the work three times. And let's take a look and see what those recordings are, because some of you mentioned individual ones and the ones that you prefer and whatnot, but, but I think it will make the point clear if we look at the group of them. And there are three. So first, the first one was this one. This is an RCA stereo. It's with Pierre Monteux and the London Symphony, and it was recorded in 1958, released in 1959, or somewhere around there. Maybe recorded in 57, released in 58, something like that. And if any of you give me any more detail, I will ban you forever from every place <laughs> because we don't care. And the point is just to get the general, general sort of, you know, it was around 1958, so let's say 58, okay? It's splendid, absolutely splendid. Monteux was a great, great Brahms conductor. The LSO was in rough shape at this period, but Monteux had them playing quite well in this recording. And Schering, of course, was in his prime and was a marvelous, marvelous artist. And his Brahms concerto was one of his great works, his great efforts. So there you go. So here's this one. Four years later, in 1962, and here I have the date exactly because it's in the back of the little thingy here, on the back of the sleeve, um, he did it again with the London Symphony, conducted by Antal Dorati, who was also a very fine Brahms conductor, believe it or not, although he isn't often acknowledged as such, but he was a very good conductor generally, and it was a Mercury Living Presence recording. Of course, this was an RCA Living Stereo. Take your pick. They were state-of-the-art sonically for their day, and here he was again doing his his... Brahms Violin Concerto. I mean, you know, they're virtually identical, not sonically, interestingly enough, but interpretively, they're quite similar. Extremely, extremely similar. So, but there they are, one on Mercury, one on RCA. And then 10 years later, or 11 years later, with the Concertgebouw Orchestra under Bernard Heitink in 1973, I think it is here, Somewhere like about then, 10 years later, he did it again. And here it is on Decca, formerly Phillips. And some of you have expressed a preference for this version. Some of you have said that he wasn't in his good technical estate when he made this version and that the Monteux is preferable. Strangely, I don't think anybody said that, Dor that the Dorati is preferable, even though it was mentioned. And for a lot of people, this is the best of all. It's really quite astonishing. So here they are. Let's, let's make a little 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 deck of cards here. Here they are. The Sharing Brahms Violin Concertos, not one of which I mentioned. And while I acknowledge quite freely that any one of them could have been in the list that I did mention, what, what does this tell us? Well, I know that some of you have expressed preferences for one over the other, but what are the differences really? I mean, how profound are the differences? How much do they matter in the 
grand scheme of Brahms violin concerto things. I would suggest, and it's heretical to say so, and the, the, the gods of criticism may strike me down for saying it, I would suggest that they don't matter a heck of a lot. I don't think Schering's performances matter a heck of a lot. Not that they're not great. But when you have so many versions of the same work done by the same people, sometimes with the same orchestra, sometimes with the same conductor, there is a limit to how crazy these, these minute, minute differences are going to matter. You cannot sit around unless there's a gross difference from one performance to the next make make qualitative judgments that are in any way reasonable i mean i, I like to talk about facts as a critic i like to say this performance is faster than that performance or or they're flat here or they miss a note there or the rhythm is flabby there things that we can actually quantify so that when you listen to the record you can hear it and say ah i heard that now whether or not that matters to you, whether or not that's significant, what, what qualitative effect that has on the performance is a very, very subjective thing. It always has to be and it always will be. So given that that's the case, when you've got the same violinist doing the same thing three times within a, let's say, 15 year period, unless his technique has gone completely down the toilet and his interpretive interpretive approach has completely altered, it's just not going to make that much difference. And then you, you take a step back for a moment and we put sharing part of a, a school of violinists who are very, very gifted, but who are very, very good, who are all operating from a similar sort of late romantic violin technique aesthetic. And you ask yourself, how much is his performance going to differ from everybody else's performance? And the answer to that is, well, um, at least with the violinist themselves, the violinists themselves, they have a personalized tone or way of phrasing or way of doing something. Sometimes that's detectable and extremely noticeable. Sometimes it's much less so. But again, the difference, the absolute difference between one performance and another, especially when you have different violinists working with the same orchestras or the same conductors, is going to be rather small. And so, my friends, I hate to say it, but however much you love this guy, you can do just as well if he had never existed. And that's a fact. And I dare anyone to tell me what it is what specific thing it is about the Brahms Violin Concerto that we know that because Schering did it, that we would not know had he never done it and why that matters given the recordings that I did mention and all of the ones that I didn't, some of which are marvelous. I mean, you see where I'm going with this? Collecting classical music is a wonderful thing. Listening to different performances is a wonderful thing. Listening to 50 performances that are marvelous is wonderful, even if most of them are mostly similar. It's, a, it's, it's great, it's rewarding, it's, it's refreshing, it's, 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 it's all positive things. It truly is. But from a, a perspective of a newcomer looking to hear the work, or even a, a serious collector looking to choose different performances. I, I've always taken the position personally, and this is my personal thing, that artists don't matter. I couldn't care less about them. They could all be dead tomorrow and it would not matter a whit, except for the fact that they play the music that I want to hear. That's a big except. So they're necessary for that. But to have all of them doing the same work and sometimes doing the same work multiple times, I just can't get excited about that. I never have. I absolutely never have. I think that's crazy. And I think chasing after them, that's why I think these cultists, the Fort Wengler people and the whatever people are all crazy because, because you're looking for teeny, teeny, tiny differences and you're tremendously exaggerating their value. And I, 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 don't, I don't hear it. I think, I think that that's how, you know, simply being, you're hallucinating when you do that. You're making things up. And of course, you have a right to do that too. That's delightful. But my job 
My job is to try and make recommendations to you and tell people what makes the most sense, what's logical in terms of their spending, in terms of their collecting, and in terms of their approach to the music. And I, I maybe it's a very arrogant thing, but I do believe that the world of classical music would be far better off if we cared about artists and their personalities much less, and about composers and the works that they write much more. I truly, truly believe that. I mean, I'll give you another quick example. Milstein. Milstein, I pointed out, made at least two recordings of the Brahms Concerto. He actually made three. And one of you pointed out that I left one out, the one, the stereo one, conducted by Anatole Fistolari with the Philharmonia. Well, yes, I did leave it out, but I don't leave it out because I don't know it. It's right here. <laughs> I have the box, and it's right there. I know it's there. But what would be the point? <laughs> of waving another flag in front of it and saying, oh yeah, there's a third Milstein one. They're all very good. Pick one. Pick one and have a good time. I mean, it's true. There are times when uh, the violinist technique has gone to <laughs> out the window. I mean, it happened with Yehudi Menuhin, for example. There may be very strong differences in how he sounds from one remake to the next. And of course that matters. And it's my job to point it out, your job to hear it and tell me if I don't point it out. That, that goes without question. That's for sure. But by the same token, I mean, the number of performer, performers who are willing to rethink an interpretation and do something entirely differently the second time around is rather small. It really is rather small. One of the things that has opened up a whole new field for that, frankly, is the period instrument movement. And that's a good thing because the period instrument movement has encouraged people who are doing things one way to try them another way. That's all good. That's what Gil Shaham did. Gil Shaham did the Brahms Concerto magnificently with Claudio Abbado and the Berlin Philharmonic, and then perhaps encouraged by the period instrument movement or his relationship with the Knights Chamber Orchestra, or a, just a total rethinking of how the work could be, he redid it in a completely different manner. And that justified making another version. And God help him if he does it again. It's enough. And that's my point. So I wanted to just mention this and and bring up the issue because it's not that I don't like Mr. Shering. He's marvelous. I think he's great. I think these performances are great. But when you have works that are done this frequently by this many great artists resulting in this many great performances, the, the importance of each one of them dwindles correspondingly. And that's and we have to deal with it. We just have to deal with it. We all deal with it in our own way. So I, I hope that sort of clears the air for some of these issues, or at least serves as food for thought and further consideration. I also might point out that uh, Mr. David Aiken made a very, very interesting point in his comments about how he now listens to the work for the accompaniments, because the accompaniments, at least in the Brahms concerto, are just as important as the solo. And if the same guy's going to do it more or less the same way, you're better off listening to the orchestra and the conductor. And he's got a very good point there. That's a whole nother consideration that you want to make, you may, you may want to keep in mind. So anyway, I do suggest that we keep on listening, even though we have a hundred billion of them, but we can listen to other people doing other things or other works. We don't have to listen to 5,000 versions of the same one. And that's what I really hope comes out of this whole discussion, because we talk about so much music. I talk about so much music besides these standard repertoire pieces. And I so wish that people would listen to different things to other things, because I see what the, the traffic is. I say Brahms Concerto, and boom, everybody wants to hear about the Brahms Concerto. But if I talk about the Erke Mellorton Violin Concerto, we get this many people. And that's a shame, because it may be just as good, or just as pleasant, or you may like it even better, but you will never know if you do not keep on listening. So thank you for joining me, friends. Take care.